Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. How are you doing today? On with the legendary investor, Mr. Greg Dickerson. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great, Michael. How are you today? I'm doing really well. So, folks, this video is actually being recorded Ju July 5th for posting on July 12th. Why? It's because I'm taking a couple of days off. So I want to make sure you have some original content. And Greg was gracious enough to give us four interviews today. So I appreciate it. Yeah, man, it's good to be here always. I enjoy these conversations. And uh, so let's do a little future forecasting. That's so right. Gonna air a week from today. So we're going to forecast what the economy is <laughs> going to look like a week from now. That's going to be awesome. So we're actually going to do a part A, part B conversation today. And we're going to talk, we're going to use the, the barrier of whenever the peak was in your market, right? So the part A of this conversation, Greg, is I just want to, I want to paint the vision of what it was like being active in the real estate cycle before the crash. Uh, again, my journey starts in 02 and I wrote it all the way to 07. I, I'll share the stories and what was going on in my market. But why don't you remind people what you were doing in that period uh, in your investment journey? Yeah, so if you're talking about 08, 09, I was a builder developer, you know, hot and heavy. I was real estate heavy. I mean, everything I had, all of my net worth was in real estate. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I had some companies as well, but, you know, the bulk of it was, was in real estate. But um, especially at that specific time, I had a lot of projects going on in a lot of different areas. Yeah. Um, the peak of our market at first was 0405. Interest rates ticked up a little bit. We saw a little bit of a slowdown. Uh, we had a dip for about a year or two. Then it came back in you know 2007 ish, and it was off to the races. But starting from 1997 until basically 2008 9, other than that little cooling off period 0405, which across the country, everybody saw a little dip then. That was really the peak of the market prior to the big run up in 08, 09. Um, being where I came from, all I saw was a bull run yeah. in real estate. That was it. I mean, there was a, when I bought my first house in the early 90s, yeah. you know, it was, it was kind of slow. So there was real estate was kind of sluggish in the early 90s through that 95, you know, time period. And actually my first house that I bought, I sold it for what I paid for it five years later. I bought it in 1990, oh, wow. sold it in 1995 for the same amount of money. Hmm. And uh, I was working in restaurants at the time and I got transferred to Asheville, North Carolina, spent a couple of years there before I moved to the Outer Banks in 97. Hmm. Sold that house again after a two year period for about what we paid for it. Oh, and wow. then moved into a house uh, on the Outer Banks in, in uh, uh, 1997 is when we moved there, bought a house as my, my um, third home. And I had gained no equity <laughs> years in the first seven years of home ownership, zero, you know, my down payment just kept moving forward. That's funny. And had, had built no wealth, no equity, no nothing. Cause the real estate market was flat. Mm -hmm. Interest rates were high. Market was flat. Yeah. And, uh, but that house that I bought in 1997 doubled Ooh. over the next 10 years. And what I ended up doing is I left that house owner financed a guy that worked for me so he could get into his first house and yeah, whole creative story, but he ended up paying me twice what I paid for because, you know, market appreciated and yeah. it was a good deal for him. So long story short, that's, that's how I got there. But um, I was, I was hot and heavy real estate 08, 09 before the crash. And again, from that point of 97 on, everything was going up. Business was easy. It was going up. Everybody was busy. It was easy to make money. It looked like nothing would ever end. The market that I was in specifically was a resort vacation market that had been up and up and up as far as rental incomes and all that. Never saw an issue, never saw a downtick, um, even when the real estate market slowed a little bit. But all of the older veterans of the market all told me, hey, we remember the SNL crisis. And I, what year was that? I can't, the savings. 87, 86. It was the tax changes. Yeah. So they all, they all talked about that time frame that they were all in it down, down during that time. And even in some of the, you know, I guess, later 80s or whatever, you know, where there were some issues, they said, man, it shut off like a faucet. They said, mm. we remember it. It stopped overnight. And I was like, there's just no way this can end. Money was <laughs> no easy. Way it can finance end. was easy. You know, everybody, anybody could get a loan, you know, yeah. income was good. Rents were going up. It's like, how can this ever end? Right. And sure enough, it did. <laughs> yeah, it did. Yeah. My, my memories of pre-crash again, um, kind of the same time frame, And I was, I was just a single family home landlord, right? That's all I was buying, but it, it's pretty funny, right? So the first house I bought was 107. I think the second one was like 121 because I had to save up for the down payment. So the first house was like 02 and then kind of middle of the late 03 and then four. Uh, I remember trying to buy the, the ninth door, which would have been the eighth property um, and nothing cash flow, right? I remember 
I remember th- feeling like an idiot. Cause again, it was, it was, you're right. It was just like, you, you felt like it could never end. It was so exciting. You know, everything was going up and I just remember going, what am I doing wrong? Right. Cause that first house, just for example, right. Was suddenly worth 260 grand, but the rent didn't move right in my market. Rents didn't move because every, we saw just a disproportionate amount of people becoming moving from renters to owners. Uh, so rents were soft. I mean, rents were flat for five years while prices were shooting up in my market. Rents were flat. They, they might've moved 50 bucks, but they were pretty flat. And I, re- I just remember going, we can't buy anything, honey. I, it's just, the cash flow, which is what I buy for, just didn't make sense. And ultimately, uh, before the crash started, we started doing 1031 exchanges out of houses into an asset I didn't know anything about, which was multifamily. And then lo and behold, the, the market rolled over. But yeah, I remember, the other thing I remember about, you're right, everybody was getting a loan. I remember the first loan we got in 02, like having to go through financial statements and actually it felt like I was, it felt like you were going to the dentist, right? It was a process. It wasn't hard, but it was a process. By the end of that, you know, the last two or three loans we got, it was like, yeah, sign this piece of paper. Don't fill anything in. We'll fill it in for you. I'm like, what? Yeah, it was- yeah I didn't have any of that, but um, I, I, you know, I had to fill in the blanks myself, but it was all stated. So all you had to do was yeah. state your income. I had assets, sign- had, you know, income, had a good credit score, you, you know, so that's all you needed. You could borrow whatever you want. But the interesting thing was that lender was Lehman Brothers, you know, so- Lehman Brothers was the lender du jour for these income properties. So, yeah. you know, I was a subprime borrower in the sense that I was borrowing more than I should have been able to yeah. versus like, you know, the low income subprime lending that was being done, you know, just to get people into houses, you know, good intentions gone bad, right? Yeah. That was supposed to spur home ownership, but they just put people in a house that had no reserves, no, you know, Gosh. no ability to, you know, sustain any kind of a downturn. But I was doing investment properties that were income based. So the income, mm-hmm qualified the properties, you know, yeah. so um, it, that was a big part of it. And it was like commercial, you know, these, these deals that I was doing, you know, early mm-hmm. on. So it was really interesting times. But again, we were all just doing, and I remember talking to friends of mine that were builders, you know, and like I would build them and sell them. And, and you know, then I started learning, well, shoot, you know, if you keep them a year and you <laughs> rent them up, yeah. they'll sell for even more. And we were talking about, it, it's like, it's really nuts. People will pay you you know, 20, 30% more, you know, almost like a year after just because it had a good rental season behind it, you know, yeah, crazy. Uh, it was, it was really interesting. So that's, you know, that's the value add game of old. And I mean, some of these things were significant. They were doing, you know, 150 to 300,000 a year in rental income on a beach house. Wow. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that I was playing with. So they were like little apartment buildings. And again, this was, this was uh, seasonal rentals before Airbnb, right? This, this folks, this is 20 years ago. Yeah. I mean, VRBO started, okay. you know, at some point, I can't remember when, when the internet was a thing, probably 0405, we okay. had VRBO, but yeah, Airbnb wasn't even around. Yeah. The other thing I remember about lending then, you, your stuff was doing commercial. It was really funny, right? Because when we started this, we were prime borrowers, right? We had mm-hmm. credit income. Uh, then the whole subprime thing blew up. But I, I don't remember if you remember this, but remember when Alt-A became a thing? We were Alt-A mm-hmm. buyers. Basically, we were using stated income. We didn't have season leases, all of those things. So we didn't quite get prime rates. We weren't subprime, but we were this thing called Alt-A. I remember feeling so proud. It was like, I, don't <laughs> th- I don't even think it's talked about anymore. It was just some of the nonsense that was going on in the market, uh, getting, getting loans. And it, it was, looking back on it, it should have been a sign that, this, that there was a problem, right, in the lending market. And again, as a landlord, I mean, there was never a worse time to be an apartment landlord, at least in my market. P- tenants were moving from apartments to home ownership at record numbers. Yeah, yeah, it was interesting times. I had to shift my whole business model. So, you know, I used to build, you know, multi-million dollar beach houses, two, three million dollar beach houses. And then I switched after after all that went down because you couldn't get money to borrow it. And, you know, we saw a little bit of a dip in the rental market during that time period, but not much because, you know, everybody thought the world economically was coming to an end in 08, 09. The markets were crashing, real estate was diving. You couldn't get loans from, from, you know, banks for different things um, for certain projects like we were doing. So all yeah. that just stopped. You couldn't yeah. borrow money to borrow, you know, buy apartments. We'll, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about all that in part B. We'll, we'll okay. take yeah, what we'll talk about part two. Yeah, yeah. Post, post. But anyways, yeah. it was interesting times. I was very heavy. I don't know. I had about $30 million worth of construction loans out that I was trying to refinance that wow. I had yeah. permanent mortgage commitments on. But then when I went to get the money, banks were non-existent. <laughs> wouldn't do it. Yeah. I had no clue what was going on. Yeah. The other thing I want to talk about is the environment up to the bubble point and how it's different today. 
Yeah. Uh, the first thing I want to point out is lending is remarkably different today, right? People that want to point at a chart and say price A and price B are the same, don't understand the lending of how just how drastically the lending environment is today. Is that fair? Yeah, you got to have a down payment back then. You, you, you didn't necessarily have to have a down payment. You could use the equity in the property. Now, the difference is you're paying based on appraised value or purchase price, whichever is less. Back then, it was on appraised value um, because it was always more than your purchase price, generally. Um, so you could you could get into those things with zero money. So I was, you know, I, I had equity in what I was building. So I would go in, I would get a construction loan as the builder developer. I had my own company that I would hire to build the project. I would get a 10% working capital deposit. So I got cash back at closing. I got funded 100% of the loan. You can't do that anymore. Yeah. You got to come to the table with cash. You got to have reserves. They want to see three to six months, you know, worth of payment reserves in the bank. Some are, are requiring mortgage insurance. Some aren't things like that. So it's, you know, and it's getting more stringent and more difficult as we go along, as values inflate, as the housing market bubble continues mm -hmm. to grow, lenders are becoming more and more strict in terms of the guidelines and requirements. So very, very different than it was before. Yeah. The last thing I want to point out is uh, about the, 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 like up to the peak, right? The party's still going. What, what really I remember is people were getting yes answers to loans or loan products that they shouldn't have gotten. They just, oh, yeah. they were bad loans. And I don't think there's a lot of bad loans being written today, uh, in my opinion, but uh, there is talk about some, I don't know, some, some government programs basically incenting home ownership again. Uh, and, and I hope that they haven't round, they haven't filled in the gaps yet. So there's still questions, but it just feels like they're setting some people up for failure, right? Getting somebody into a house that they don't have the reserves and experiences to, to really manage may get them on the property ladder for a year or two, but it really creates a bad taste in their mouth when they get foreclosed or short sold or they have to sell because they don't, they can't fix it up. So I see some, Yeah, I don't know the details of those programs. I think it's down payment assistance and mm -hmm. grants and things like that. Yep. More than anything else, I think you still have to qualify. You know, oh, I it hope wasn't so. like it was before. You didn't have to qualify. You just had, you just, you know, anybody could get in the house, even if you couldn't afford it, you had a bad credit score, try to spur home ownership to help lower income areas grow in terms of home ownership and those types of things. And, you know, they found out that that doesn't work. Um, so it's very different now. I think even with those new programs, that's going to make a difference. And then the loan products, like you talked about, I mean, uh, you can get a reverse mortgage, you know, yeah. when you're, you know, and those types of things, but I, you know, there were negative amortization loans. Neg -am, where, yeah. yeah. Neg am. And those things were, where you had a minimum interest payment of like 1%. It was ridiculous. <laughs> what, what they would do is, so you could check on the box, you could pick your payment, right? It was yeah. a payment option arm. So you had interest only, you had a, um, um, amortized payment where you could pay some principal. And then you had a minimum payment where you'd pay like 1%. And then the rest of that payment would get added to the back of the loan. So you're essentially tapping <laughs> the equity in a house that you already borrowed 80% 80 <laughs> to get into. So, I mean, there was just all kinds of crazy creative things out there that, that they were doing because they were just packaging all these yeah. things and selling them out as, um, you know, mortgage backed securities. And, you know, Wall Street was just eating that stuff up. Yeah, it was, it was a crazy time. So again, folks, this is part A, what we were doing. We were heavy real estate. We were trying to do deals. Loan products were weird. Uh, anybody could get a loan. You could really bundle them up. It was, it was a crazy time. Part B of this is going to be what happened to us after the crash? How did we, how did we get through it? How did we survive? Yeah, because we took advantage things? of all of them. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, well, Greg, one time, how can people follow you? Yep. GregDickerson.com. That's where all my info is. YouTube channel, podcast, social media, GregDickerson.com. Thanks, buddy.